are solutions notes and these are pretty basic solutions notes um, it is gonna we're gonna cover two things we're gonna cover concentration and colligative properties and uh, how we can use those things to figure out stuff about unknown substances. So first of all, the whole process of dissolving. Most ionic compounds dissolve endothermically. So what that means is that if you have a little beaker of some solvent and you add into it your salt, the Delta T is going to be negative. It's going to go down. The temperature is going to go down. And the reason for that is because the salt itself, let's say it's sodium chloride, and you know it's the whole lattice, crystal lattice thing, the energy it takes to break this bond is actually more. So the energy of, let's say, the ionic bond is more than the energy of the ion dipole interaction that's going to happen when this guy dissolves into water and you have you know your water molecule well let me do this and then um, you know chlorine's attracted here sodium's attracted here this ion dipole interaction releases less energy than the energy of the ionic bond required to break and so that energy has to come from somewhere it's going to come from the solvent and so the temperature is going to go down but there are a few ionic compounds that will actually dissolve exothermically and that's because this ionic bond here is actually weaker than the ion dipole force that's formed. And so that, it doesn't happen very often because as you know, ionic compounds, ionic bonds are really, really strong, but it does happen. So calcium chloride dissolves in water with an increase in temperature of the water. Is this process exo or endothermic and use IMF's intermolecular forces to explain? So we have calcium chloride, CaCl2, and once it is put into some water, the change in temperature is positive. Well, anytime the temperature goes up, we have an exothermic process, and using IMFs, we would just simply say that the um, ionic bonds required less energy, less energy to break. then was released by the ion dipole interaction. So that delta E was positive, that energy had to go somewhere, it's going to go into the solvent and increase the temperature. There are a couple other ways that you could phrase that, but that one's good enough. Okay, then we got some um, vocabulary, just some basic stuff. You need to know what all of these words mean. I'm pretty sure you know what the first one is. The only one that might be new to you is miscible versus immiscible. Miscible just means that it will dissolve. Immiscible means that it won't. Units of solubility are usually expressed in grams of solute per 100 mils of water because usually we're talking about dissolving things in water. You know, the whole water's universal solvent type of thing. Um, don't get too concerned with that. But like if you had a solubility curve, then um, you would have temperature down here and you would have the this units right here. I can't write sideways, so I'm sorry. Grams of solute over 100 grams of water. And that's what would be on the y-axis and then you'd have, you know, your curve. Uh, and know how supersaturated solutions are formed. Supersaturated solutions, in order to make them all that you gotta do is you take your solution, let's say we're making a supersaturated salt solution, and we add our salt in there. We add a whole bunch of salt, lots and lots and lots of salt, to the point that not only do we have the ions here, but we have a layer of solid NaCl down here that just won't dissolve in this water at this temperature. And so what you do is you put a little bit of fire to it laugh at my drawing um, and then when you increase the temperature 
then that causes the rest of this solid sodium chloride to be able to dissolve. And then to make it super saturated, because at this point it's just saturated at that temperature, you have to very carefully lower the temperature without disturbing the solution or anything like that. Just let it sit, chill out, because if you disturb it, if you thump it, if you add more salt to it or anything like that, all that excess salt is going to crystallize out and you're not going to have super saturated solution anymore. Super saturated solutions are pretty uh, delicate, I think might be the right word here. Alright, so what things can affect solubility? Well, the biggest one is the whole rule, like dissolves like. Substances that have similar intermolecular forces tend to be soluble in each other. And, you know, back when you took beginning chemistry or maybe IPC or maybe even back in eighth grade science, you learned that polar dissolves polar and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Uh, and that's true. Uh, oil and water will not dissolve in each other because water is polar, oil is nonpolar. Um, but uh, salts and ionic compounds, they typically will dissolve in a polar substance like water because an ionic compound is really just a serious, serious, serious form of, of polar, of polarity, because, you know, it just has to deal with the exchange of electrons or the sharing of electrons, and in this case with an ionic bond, it's you know, one element gets the electrons so much so that it's basically decided that the other element doesn't get them at all. Then, if you are dissolving a solid in a liquid, like let's say you're, you know, putting that sodium chloride into water. I know this is not a reaction, it's just saying you're putting this in that. Um, then the way to get more salt to dissolve, you need to heat it up, you need to stir it, and you need to crush the salt. And that will increase the solubility of the NaCl in the water. Flip side of that, if you're dealing with dissolving a gas in a liquid, then you pretty much want the exact opposite. You want a low temperature. You want an extremely high pressure and you want as little motion as possible. An example of this one would be a soda. You know, to keep your soda from going flat, you put it in the fridge, you keep the lid on it, and you don't shake it up. Couple of ways to express concentration, and these are not the end all be all, it's just the four that I really think you need to know. Um, first one is mass percent, and it's just the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100. I, don't know why I keep forgetting to take that off. Don't write that times 100 down because this next one's on percentage. Uh, but so all you have to do to find this one is take whatever mass of solute you have, figure out the mass of solution, divide the two. You know, easy peasy. Then you got the mole fraction, which we've worked with before when we talked about gases, and it's the exact same thing. It's just the moles of some part over the total number of moles that are in the particular solution. Then you have molarity, and molarity is the one that we've worked with the most, and that's when you have moles of solute over liters of the whole solution. And the last one, the new one, is molality. And molality is just like molarity, it's moles of solute on top, but instead of liters of solution, it's kilograms of solvent. And the abbreviations for these, this one doesn't really have one, mole fraction is chi, you know, it's a capital X, molarity is a capital M, and molality is a kind of italicized lowercase m. So you need to know these, you need to know the units on these so that you can recognize them whenever you see them, know how to use them. Uh, colligative properties is any property of a solution that depends only on the quantity of the solute particles, not what they actually are, just how many of them there are. It doesn't matter if it's sugar, if it's ions, if it's, you know, some insoluble compound. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter if it's insoluble, because if it's insoluble, then you're not going to have a solution. Um, I'm sorry, first day back. I'm making some pretty careless errors here, but it's all right. Uh, it just depends on how much you have. And how much you have is measured by the Van Hoff factor. Uh, and we will use whole numbers in our calculations. It's symbolized with an I. So, like, if you had sodium chloride, well, sodium chloride, as soon as you put it into water, is going to dissociate into sodium ions and chlorine ions. So sodium chloride has a Van Hoff factor of 2. Whereas, say, sugar, glucose, well, this is not going to dissociate at all when you put it into water, and so it's only going to have a Van Hoff factor of 1. Uh, let's say you were using aluminum sulfate. 
Well, here you're going to get two aluminum ions and three sulfate ions, which gives you a Van Hoff factor of five. And it doesn't really ever go higher than five. Um, and what these colligative properties are, once you dissolve a solid solute into some solution, into some solvent, uh, it's going to take the vapor pressure and it's going to lower it. It's going to increase the boiling point and it's going to lower the freezing point. It basically, it just really wants to keep it locked in that liquid phase. Doesn't want to let it out of the liquid phase. So here are the formulas to calculate it. Um, to calculate your vapor pressure, you use the mole fraction of the solvent times the standard pressure of the solvent. We're going to work out an example of all of these in just a second, so be patient. Um, freezing point is, this is the change in the freezing point, is equal to your freezing point constant. Let me write all these out. Kf is the freezing point constant. This would be something that you would look up in a table or would be given to you. Times the molality times I, the Van Hoff factor. Boiling point looks just like the freezing point change, except this time it's the change in the boiling temperature is equal to KB is the boiling point constant. And this is an identifying characteristic for different substances. And like I said, you can look this up in a table. And the last one, osmotic pressure of the solution is, and this, this symbol right here, this kind of looks like a giant pie, uh, is equal to molarity times the ideal gas constant, 0 0.0821, times your temperature. And remember your temperature, if you're using the ideal gas constant, temperature has to be in Kelvin. There's no way around that. And, um, <clears throat> if you're curious, osmotic pressure, this is just the pressure required to prevent osmosis. Remember, osmosis is the passage of water across a membrane. So how much solute do you have to put in there to prevent, you know, under what pressure, I'm sorry, do you have to put this solution in order to stop it from letting water cross across the membrane? Okay, so all we got left is an example. Go ahead and get this example written down, and then I'm going to go to a blank screen. Uh, so that we can work it out together. Okay, so the first thing said, what is the vapor pressure of the solution at 25 degrees Celsius? And it gave us the vapor pressure of pure water. Okay, you can still see it. Uh, so the vapor pressure uh, formula is the pressure of the solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the standard pressure of the solvent. So let's figure that out. First off, mole fraction. And mole fraction, if you remember, was the moles, in this case, of the solvent divided by the total moles. So we'll just call that mole T. To figure that out, we got to look at our question. Well, it said we have 175 grams of CaCl2 and 975 grams of water. So convert both of these guys to moles. And 175 grams of calcium chloride, each mole is 111 grams. And so that's going to be equal to 1.58 moles. I'm so running out of room over there. And then with water, of course, you just divide this by 18.02 grams. And that works out to 54.2. So to figure out our mole fraction here, we're going to take our moles of solvent, which that's our water. So 54.2 divided by the total number of moles. So I'm going to add these two guys up. And so that's one part of it. And then I need to multiply this by my standard pressure of the solution. And in the question, it says that the standard pressure, the vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.76 torr. So you plug all this in. Ooh, I forgot something. Oh, bad me. 
This is 1.58 moles of calcium chloride, but calcium chloride is not going to stay. Calcium chloride, once it dissolves in water, it's going to dissociate into a calcium ion and two chlorine ions. So that's three times that. Um, so instead of 1.58, you're supposed to have 4.74. Glad I caught that before I went any farther. Um, so you plug this in and you get zero point or yeah zero point nine two zero and the units on this since it's the vapor pressure of the solution and we use twenty three point seven six torr that's going to be point nine two zero torr. This is this. That's going to be 21.9 torr. So moving on from there, um, the next question asked, what temperature will the solution freeze? So our freezing solution, or our freezing um, formula is delta Tf is equal to the freezing point constant times the molality times the Van't Hoff factor. So the freezing point constant of water, they told us in the question, is 1.86. Our molality, remember molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So we figured out up here that we have 4.74 moles of solute, it's, I'll just call them ions, divided by kilograms of solvent, well, our, it said that we had 975 grams of water, so that would be 0.975 kilograms of water. So you plug that in and you get 4.8 six molal, so that's going to go right here, 4.86 times our Van't Hoff factor, and our Van't Hoff factor is going to be three, but actually we already took care of that, didn't we? So we don't have to do that again, because the fact that we're dealing with the 4.74 as opposed to the 1.58, um, we don't need to deal with the Van't Hoff factor again. So just plug these two guys in, and you get nine point zero four degrees Celsius. Now this is not the new freezing point. This is the change in freezing point. And so we have to take the freezing point of water, which is zero degrees Celsius, and we know that it's freezing point depression, so we're going to subtract this 9.04, and we end up with a negative 9.04 degrees Celsius is our new freezing point. The next one asks us to do the same thing, except instead of for freezing point, it wants it for boiling point. So the change in the boiling point is going to be the boiling point constant times uh, the molality times the Van't Hoff factor. So the boiling point constant on this is 0.51. We've already figured out the molality of our ions, 4.86. And so that multiplied together is going to be 2.48 degrees Celsius. Now this one is boiling point increase and so we're going to take the normal boiling point of water which is 100 degrees Celsius, just take the normal boiling point of your solvent, add to it the delta T, so 2.48, and you get your new boiling point of water is 102.4, or not of water, of the solution, 102.48 degrees Celsius. Now the last question that we were asked I wish I could just erase the pen, but I can't. The last question that we were asked is what will be the osmotic pressure at 27 degrees Celsius? So let's get a black screen again and do that. So we know that osmotic pressure is equal to molarity times the gas constant times temperature. Well, the molarity, we had molarity is moles per liter. The number of moles that we have is 4.74. This is moles of solute. Liters was to figure out the liters. Whoa, we didn't. We weren't given liters. We, we were 
We were given density though. And density was 1.1 grams per milliliter. So we know that total we had the 975 grams of water. We had 175 grams of calcium chloride. So that adds up to 100 or 1150 grams of solution. So to figure out milliliters of solution, we're going to take that 1150 grams. It's 1.10 grams per milliliter. Grams cancel. Uh, 1150 divided by 1.10 gives us 1050 mils. We don't want it in milliliters, we want it in liters. So just move the decimal place over. So coming back up here, our volume was 1.050. And so that means our molarity <coughs> is 4.51. So bring that back over here. Molarity, 4.51. R, 0.0821. T is 27, but remember we can't use degrees Celsius, we have to use Kelvin. So 27 plus 273, or you could have just put 300. So you plug all that in, and you end up with that the new osmotic pressure is 111. And then what are the units on this? Well, molarity is moles per liter. R is liters, atmospheres, mole, Kelvin. And of course, temperature is just Kelvin. And so the liters will cancel, moles will cancel, Kelvins will cancel, the only unit left is atmospheres. So the osmotic pressure of this solution is 111 atmospheres. Um, and keep in mind, we have assumed in all of these cases that the Van Hoff factor is exactly three. In reality, it's probably gonna behave as a little bit less than three, but for calculation purposes, it's fine. All right, so the last thing that we can do with this is use the information that we figure out in the lab to figure out the molar mass of uh, an unknown compound. And all you gotta do is use the formulas you already have and work your way back to molar mass. So here's this example. Go ahead and get this wrote down and then we'll go to a black screen to work it out. All right, so the first thing that you uh, need to do, and you probably figured this out as soon as you started reading, you saw the percentages and went, oh, I've got to find the empirical formula. So let's find the empirical formula. We have 31.57% carbon, or we can just say grams of carbon, because we're going to make our 100 gram assumption. 5.30 grams of hydrogen, and then the rest is going to be oxygen, so that means 63 point one three percent or one three grams is going to be oxygen so divide this by 12.01 because that's the molar mass of carbon and you get 2.63 yes 2.63 take this divide it by 1.01 and you end up with 5.30 <laughs> it didn't change much uh, take oxygen, divide it by 16, and you end up with 3.95. And then remember from here, you take them all and divide it by whichever one was the smallest so that you get whole numbers. We're looking for the subscripts in our empirical formula. So take all of them and divide by 2.63, and we get 1 and... 2 and 1.5 so we got to get rid of the 0.5 so take all of these and multiply by 2 and you end up with 2 4 5 so our empirical formula is C2 sorry not 5 3 C2 H4 O3 so there's our empirical formula then our next step is to calculate the number of moles by first figuring out the molarity of molality of the solution using that freezing point depression. Um, it told us in the question that the solution froze our let's say second freezing point 
was negative 5.20 degrees Celsius. And of course we know the normal freezing point of water is zero. So that means that the delta T, the change in the freezing point was 5.2. So we're gonna take that and we know that that's gonna be equal to the freezing point constant of water times the molality times the Van Hoff factor. Well the freezing point um, constant of water is still 1.86. Molality is what we don't know. And the Van Hoff factor on this one, this is an organic compound, so it is not going to ionize. So that means the Van Hoff factor on this is just going to be 1. So in reality, we can just ignore it. So to find the molality, all we have to do is take 5.2, divide by 1.86, and you get. 2.80 moles per kilogram of solvent, and in this case, it's kilogram of water. So there's that. Now convert this molality into moles using the known mass uh, or known volume of water. <coughs> So we know that we used 25 mils of water. We can very easily say that that is also going to be 25 grams of water because water has a density of one, one gram per milliliter. And then we need to convert this to kilograms. So we just go one, two, three. So it's 0 0.025 kilograms of water. So we can take 2.80 moles of solute over one kilogram of water. And we have 0.025 kilograms of water. The reason I put this on top is because I want these two guys to cancel out, which they now do. And I'm just going to multiply. So 2.8 times 0 0.025 is 0 0.0700 moles of my solute. And I was told in the question that I used 10.56 grams of my solute. Well, molar mass is grams per mole. Here's my mass of solute. Here's my moles of solute. work that out and I have grams per mole molar mass. So the molar mass of this particular substance is 151 grams per mole. And so then to find the um, molecular formula, I take my empirical formula, I need to figure out the mass of that. So this would be about 24 plus 4 plus 48. So that would be 52. 56, 76. And if you'll notice, comparing this to this, take the molecular mass, divide it by the empirical mass, and this is about 2. 76 times 2 is about 151. I think it's more like 152, but you know what? Close enough. So that means we need to take our empirical formula, multiply it by 2. So our molecular formula at the end of all this mess is C4H8O6. And that, ladies and gents, is all we have. If you have any questions, you know where to find me.